Thank you, Lee. Um, so let's see. All right, video working. Hello. And a uh, banner working in the background. And slides are shared. And audio is good. So let's go ahead and dive right in. So uh, as far as uh, talk today, I'm going to talk about a lot of what real world hacks look like kind of from start to finish. Because I think there's a lot of confusion as to what does this really mean if it's a end-to-end -end hack or what did the Twitter hack look like or what did I don't know some other organization hack look like uh, there's been a lot of big breaches in the world what does that actually mean and how can we start developing our own ability to answer interesting questions and that's the building your own home lab portion of the talk as well so uh, who am I hi I'm Jeff um, What's on screen now is what I normally do for like sand style presentations, but I'll, I'll keep things a little bit simpler um, and kind of the more of the start, which I think is more interesting. Um, I started with computers with like not until high school. I had like a programming class in high school. There was um, we, we built a chat program. I was all excited. And of course, I was going to like, well, let me add some additional functionality here. So I had a button on my chat window that if you joined me, I could open your CD tray or power off your computer. And I was all excited about that. So I wasn't really thinking about the security aspect so much as, boy, is that fun. I may have also found that my high school uh, gave administrative rights, which is a really powerful word, to everyone, every student who logged in, um, including remotely. And then I found out, like, like Lee was saying, the features that you didn't know existed, like Windows has built in, you can shut down remote computers if you have their permissions. But if I have permissions, then everybody else does too. So I thought about for a long time, and this is where the, the kind of the moral aspect comes in, and I did not do this, but I thought about putting a program in the startup folder on a library machine so that the next person who logged on would automatically shut down every computer in the district. I did not do this, however, because that would be bad and immoral and cause disruption. And let's be honest, I probably would have been caught anyway. But it got me thinking more about security. So I started with an internship, local uh, district IT team, started doing like PC repair, whether it's uh, hardware, hey, your sound card's bad or whatever. Um, <laughs> did a little bit of pushing carts and cashiering for a bit. Uh, like worked for Harry and David, deploying software remotely, starting getting a little higher and higher up in terms of the technology involved. And then I got a, a real adult job for a, a local city that I, I learned a lot there because uh, having a breadth of experience, right? Trying a lot of different things helps a lot with your learning. I think that's uh, helped me in my career, just having that kind of broad background. I've done a lot of things in different areas within IT and helping people with computers, right? Unfortunately, printers just off screen here are always a problem, absolutely. But I think it's useful um, to go through that pain of troubleshooting. Helps you understand people, empathize, deal with them more. Um, I was still going to college at this time and with permission, right? I knew a few of the folk there, started doing my first penetration test as in, hey, guy in charge of IT for the college, if I give you a report at the end, can I hack the college, please? And they actually said yes, which was awesome. And it's part of why I'm here today, right? Doing my own stuff and getting to not wear shoes on a Wednesday morning because I work from home, right? Got some advantages going on here. Um, because I got that permission and kind of launched my own more specialized career. Started with IT and then got a little bit more specialized later. And then, yeah, last year I founded my own company because there's parts of IT that, I, that I've sampled a lot of different areas that I like more. And a uh, little highlight there, the local uh, police department that I used to work under had their own computer forensics shop that I got to work with as well. It was uh, quite fun to work with. Um, let's see. Um, I am trying to watch the chats as we go, by the way. Oh, what is Windows XP migrations? Well, let me tell you, before Windows X, uh, 7, before Windows 10, there was an old Windows XP. We were actually migrating to Windows XP at the time. It came out in 2001. Many of you weren't born then, and now I'm sad. Um, <laughs> let's see. What did you find when you hacked the college? That I could successfully hack the college um, through a lot of stuff put together that uh, I'll have a little bit of an outline for.
Um, does this have a programming thing? Uh, nah, not so much programming, so much as using resources other people have built. All right, programming is to solve your own problems, which there are many, and sometimes you want to scratch your own itch. Um, using other people's stuff is when you want to solve a problem that other people have solved before. I'm a big fan of um, using uh, existing tooling. All right, how long have I worked for SANS? Uh, I've been teaching for like four or five years now, I think, and involved for seven or so. All right. So I'm going to talk about the next section, the fun section, a purely hypothetical discussion about the Metasploit framework. Metasploit framework is a free and open source, which means that all of the code is given publicly to everyone. And it's meant for penetration testing, authorized hacking. It's an exploitation framework, right? So some terminology to work with. Um, if I'm trying to log into, I don't know, Isaac's gmail.com, right? If I'm trying to log in over and over, and Isaac, maybe your password is, I don't know, Fluffy Bunny 12, or maybe it's uh, password one or whatever, right? There's only so many common passwords that people tend to use. Um, and yeah, that's password guessing. Password cracking is a little different. If I've already been onto Linus's machine, for example, or maybe his phone, there's stuff derived from his password, right? kind of like blend it all up and take a little sample. It's password hash. And I can take lots of guesses. Uh, there was a talk yesterday about password uh, cracking, if I recall. But that means I'm only limited by my own hardware. There's password spraying, uh, which is like password guessing. It's just a little bit more specialized. And then what we really commonly see today is credential stuffing. I think we've already had one shout out. Uh, <laughs> uh, we had one shout out, uh, was it yesterday? for having a password manager, right? So you don't have the same site all over. Because uh, we have the XKCD reference, boy do I love XKCD, uh, where you might think that it's like NSA that like got in the, somebody's house and found your passwords that you wrote down. That's not really how hacking works on the real internet. For the most part, it's like, hey, Smash Mouth, that was a band that people used to care about, right? Someone leaked all the email addresses and passwords. Let's try to use all of those email addresses and all of those passwords to Venmo or something, right? That's credential stuffing, right? Stuffing all of the credentials that you found into some other service, right? Maybe it's their bank, whatever, right? All right, so what does hacking look like start to finish? Different people have different visualizations for this. Uh, Lockheed Martin, a big uh, United States contracting company, um, they refer to their cyber, cyber kill chain, trademark, registered trademark, right? They talk about doing reconnaissance, then weaponization. And some of this, like, it, this is accurate, but I don't think it's as useful um, a discussion. So instead, I prefer having uh, kind of a common language. And I had to have this terminology in here, right? The weird flex, but okay, I had to have it in here somewhere. Uh, MITRE finally standardized a lot of the language we use um, around hacking, right? Oh, well, you're doing defense evasion. Like, oh, you mean working around antivirus? Yeah, yeah, but there's lots of techniques for defense evasion, right? Initial access, there's only so many ways to get into an environment inside. And this is important terminology, right? But a lot of vendors, oh gosh, like the semantics of the world, the McAfee's of the world, the Microsoft's of the world have been really been saying, yeah, we fully support, support the MITRE ATT&CK uh, terminology. We, we have it all over. We MITRE ATT&CK, matrix ATT&CK, framework ATT&CK all the time. It's great. Um, let's see, what class did I take in high school? Oh, uh, the question about phones. There's going to be a little uh, stuff on phone hacking here shortly. Um, doo -doo 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 literally have access to delete all the data on my mom's Android phone because I logged into it with my Google account one time. Yeah, it turns out if you log into a phone or some device with a, a Google account, kind of by default, you have access to that account forever. It's a little terrifying. Um, there are ways to uh, kick out an account uh, with control, but don't log in. It's completely side note, just based on the, the live question. Never, ever, ever log into your Google account on anybody else's phone, period, right? Um, Heather Mahal did a great talk on that uh, yesterday, right? And your phone is now an extension of your brain, 
right? And your Google account, right? The fact that you could, by having my phone or having access to my account, know where I've been, what I've been thinking based on my Google searches, because that's about as reflexive as thought at this point, um, that's, that's pretty valuable. Don't log into other people's phones with your Google account. All right. Hacking, start to finish. Uh, question came in, are we just going to listen? Yeah, there, I'll have a bunch of shout outs for stuff you can do in your own lab here shortly, um, but I'm not gonna have a required homework or anything like that. All right, so this is my own thing to keep hacking discussions easier. Pretty much every hack needs some kind of internal access, right? Because Microsoft.com, the public website, doesn't have a lot that you can attack but if you're inside like Microsoft campus, there is all sorts of internal applications. There's a lot more what we call attack surface. So pretty much every hack needs internal access. Pretty much every hack as well needs some kind of privileges because normally not everyone can just tweet as, you can tweet at, you can't tweet as Elon Musk or if you're like an internal uh, computer enterprise, right? Not everyone's supposed to be able to read credit card Excel spreadsheet, right? <laughs> right? And it takes an attacker a while, it takes a hacker a while to figure out where the valuable stuff is. And that takes time. I think a lot of defenders, a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of defenders kind of underemphasize that it takes some time for hackers to figure out what in the heck is going on in this environment. Oftentimes getting privileges takes a lot less time than figuring out how the network works. And then usually most hacks are about stealing data, whether it's the smash mouth usernames and passwords, or whether it's uh, credit cards and not XLS, or whether it's taking some action, right? Tweeting as Elon Musk, for example, cough. So we're gonna come up with an example, completely hypothetical target, Twitter. And I'm gonna come up with some doctored screenshots that totally aren't the official Elon Musk that is the real Elon Musk verified account. They even got the check mark and everything, right? Where he says, I'm gonna double any Bitcoin payment. You send me money online, I'll send it back. There's a trick here. If you sent money to Elon Musk, he wouldn't send the money back. Also, it wasn't actually Elon Musk and Bill freaking Gates, founder of Microsoft, that were, were uh, sending money back. Turns out they were lying to you, right? Let me double check on questions. Uh, internships that I do, um, mostly within all the, the stuff I said before, like helping out with IT, um, da, 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 the workshop part. I'll have a lot of shout outs for things to do, but it's not a official requirement. Uh, how do I sense when I'm being hacked? Well, eventually you start to get the spider sense. No. Um, there's all sorts of this stuff to uh, incident response, as it's known, and threat hunting. Those are its own fields because there is no visual indication of if you are hacked. Not everybody is, you know, moving your mouse around their environment, all right? That's a strong giveaway that someone's taking control of your machine, but that doesn't usually happen unless your hacker is really, really bad, all right? That's why there's a whole field to sensing when you're being hacked. But I said there's only, uh, well, it starts off with internal access, right? And Tim Malcolm Vedder said that there's five ways that you can get in. And, and this is true, right? You can hack in from the outside. Maybe if I can find a flaw in www.microsoft.com or apple.com, I can find my way in from there. Or maybe if I can find someone's credentials from that Smash Mouth board or maybe their Fortnite login, and it's the same username and password they use to get inside the network, VPN, right, from home. Well, maybe I could use that or I could fish my way in, trick users to running stuff of my choosing, like give me their internal access. You can physically walk in the door, but that has its own downsides, or trick them to accept like physical stuff, but that's pretty darn rare, supply chain attacks. Like I could say, hi, I'm the totally the UPS delivery person, and this is for you. Or I could have an in with UPS or FedEx or whatever, and all of those Amazon packages get that could intercept them, but that's pretty darn rare for realistic attackers, right? Those first three, according to the best data we have, the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, those tend to be the most common by a large margin, right? The Verizon's far more than just like a cell phone company. Uh, they also put together a lot of data from a lot of real world hacks and they categorize 
right, all of the stuff about each of those hacks. So the first three, right, hacking in from the outside or phishing or writing along some VPN, it's really, really valuable. All right, so let's say, for example, that the Twitter admin console is the goal of this hack in this completely hypothetical target. There are some people that believe, for example, that because of coronavirus, because of COVID-19, that Twitter kind of opened this secret admin console up to the outside world. Well, you could access it from home because the, you know, their headquarters is actually physically closed. There are over 500 people, <coughs> allegedly, who have access to this really, really powerful admin console. We can do things like, hey, I'm gonna take Chris LG's Twitter account and set the, uh, the email address to it for, to Jeff McJunkin at Gmail. That's me, all right? And then I could send a password reset and take over Chris LG's Twitter account because I wanna send those tasty, tasty memes as Chris, right? Maybe that's my goal. So I said we're gonna go with phishing and phishing is a type of social engineering, which is a good term to understand. Now people have different uh, definitions for it. Any act that influences a person to take an action that may or may not be in their best interest. That, that's a fair definition, but it's, it's all right, influencing people. I think that's the important part here, right? And there are lots of types of social engineering and different people kind of specialize in different ones of them, right? I know some, some of you attending now are probably really good at phone or SMS based or some other type of uh, texting app or I don't know, video chat app uh, engineering, right? No, we should really do this thing this weekend or you should really come over or let me talk to your parents so I can convince them to let you come over, right? We all do social engineering to some extent. Uh, I tend to specialize in more email based because despite my antics on screen, I'm not all that good at like talking to people in person and convincing them. Um, so I prefer the email based. It's also easier to do like send a hundred emails than talk to a hundred different people over the phone. Can you think of anything more exhausting than talking to like a hundred different people over the phone? Uh, can I hack into a phone and steal money? Well, if a uh, question came in, uh, if the phone was used to send money somehow, but it's pretty darn rare to get the full level of access to a phone, that's more like jailbreaking that Heather discussed yesterday. And on the Android side, it's pretty darn rare, even if I have uh, access as an application to be able to like intercept Samsung Pay or something like that. So it's possible, but pretty darn rare to directly receive money. Now, I might be able to find you log into Venmo or something, but yeah. Um, it's also possible that we're, we're gonna say a semi-plausible scenario here is, I'm gonna post online at some place that a lot of hackers frequent, some hacker forum or whatever, and say, I'll pay you, each of those 500 people, maybe I'll start sending emails or something to their personal email addresses and say, I'll pay you a $5,000 if you pretend to accidentally run my payload. What am I gonna do with it? Don't worry about that. I'm gonna pay you $5,000 to accidentally fall for some kind of phishing engagement, right? So I crossed out hypothetical here because it turns out I haven't been talking about a hypothetical situation this whole time because Twitter, right? Uh, I think June, July 7th or something was the actual Twitter hack. The, the internet was on fire that day because like, 70 some odd accounts got hacked with this internal admin, those screenshots before were real. Um, and yes, they, they posted about, we detected what we believe to be a coordinated social engineering attack, right? So somebody tricked our people, our admins to doing some stuff that they shouldn't have been able to access. That's pretty much what it came down to, right? So it kind of often looks like, uh, especially over the phone, um, <laughs> Phone-based social engineering is really, really powerful. The success rate, right, might be 40, 50, 60, 70 percent, right? It turns out I've, I've been IT before, right? I've, I've talked about that in my own background, and that's helpful for being able to play the role of the IT guy. Hi, are you having problems with your email today? Everybody is, or at least they don't want to have those problems. Oh, you're not? Oh, good. Well, there was some issue with the Exchange Server backend HTTPS certification. 
uh, today, so I'm going to have to have you uh, run this thing, some remote support. Now, I can have you type in these 47 character commands, or if you want, I could just take control of your screen real quick. Oh, you want that instead? Okay. Um, here. Example, if you're attending this from a Windows machine right now, run Quick Assist. It's a built-in Windows application. You are literally six numbers away from giving somebody control of your screen using a Microsoft binary, a Windows provided binary. That's pretty darn powerful, right? Uh, people mentioned something about, uh, did they, didn't they leave credentials to this internal application in Slack? And my goodness, you're, uh, you're following along quite nicely. And a uh, question about when is the Metasploit part going to begin? Look, the, the Metasploit.exe here is the first shout out for it. And straight out of Metasploit, you can fool half of antivirus companies into thinking it's not malicious. It's a Windows binary, I mean like a Windows executable, like setup.exe, like downloading I don't know, Google Chrome.exe, uh, right? That's what I mean by Windows binary here, right? Jargon using terminology for that industry is somewhat problematic. I have to catch myself on that, so thank you for asking. So it could be metasploit.exe, but it turns out um, the antivirus industry is doomed. There's a lot more to this discussion. I just did a whole presentation on it. Um, but imagine for a moment, uh, for those of you with siblings or just those of you with annoying people in your environment, imagine if you were trying to write down all the mean things that that sibling or that annoying person could do. And I have to write it down all ahead of time. And then they get to look at your notes and then think, could they come up with something that you don't like that isn't in your list? Because you've just described antivirus as an industry. Coming up with a list of bad things and then hoping that nobody finds a way around it. Right? I, I, this is my hot take for the slides here uh, because this was literally generated uh, this morning. A Windows executable, a Metasploit generated thing that no antivirus engines were flagging because antivirus as an industry is doomed. Because as many of you, with especially, I, I'm the younger sibling, I have an older brother, and I was very successful in bothering my brother, right? All right, there's more than just Windows EXE files or Windows binaries. Um, on the upper right of this slide, I have the list of file extensions that Microsoft says are bad. And what do I mean by bad? Unsafe. And there's a, a link here, and we'll share the slides for it. Um, what do I mean by unsafe? means they're all equivalent to running arbitrary, anything that you want, right? And running one thing once, like toteslegit.exe that Jeff gave you, is essentially equivalent to giving up control of that machine forever. And that's about it, right? You might think, oh, I'll just close toteslegit.exe, but what if I uh, copied immediately to a new place, right? Um, and so, just like uh, logging into my phone, right, with your Google account. Well, that's great. Well, you can kick me out, but what if I was also recording you typing in your password here? Oh, you have to do password reset as well. Ah, there's a lot of stuff to it. And it doesn't have to be a Windows executable, right? Talking about, uh, this is a screenshot from this morning. Metasploit has lots of platforms that it supports. Here, I'm using an Android payload. What do I mean by payload? It means that if you run my fake TikTok application, and by the way, you can point to a real TikTok because there's talk of, <laughs> talk of, um, there's people talking recently about banning TikTok. So people are trying to download TikTok frantically. What if I gave you, oh yeah, I downloaded TikTok. I found it online. Here you go. It runs as TikTok normally would but it also gives me full control of your phone. Don't trust Android applications. Don't trust stuff out of the Play Store. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, all right. Uh, <laughs> may or may not have a Slack and Discord running. I may have gotten a direct message. All right, um, so I said that you would need some level of internal access, so, well, I need initial access and I need internal access. It turns out Metasploit, uh, if I have a session, maybe it's that Android file that I gave before, that fake TikTok application. Maybe it's I 
paid somebody and they ran totes-legit.exe, or maybe I have some other file extension, uh, Metasploit allows this concept of routing, right? So I can use my victim's network, right? Maybe on their, they're on Twitter uh, headquarters wireless, or maybe they have a VPN active so they can take actions within Twitter, right? Or maybe they have internal access that they need for some kind of <clears throat> Twitter Slack channel that may or may not have credentials visible for everyone forever uh, to some kind of internal uh, Slack application. Um, oh, uh, people had a question about um, people setting up a VM, a fake VM, and messing with phone scammers for hours. Uh, I, fun story about that. I had one of those calls while I was at work once, and I like, hey, boss, can I take the afternoon off? And like went and bought like a prepaid debit card so I could walk through stuff and set up the VM, set up my phone to record. And those jerks of scammers never called me back. Ugh. All right. Uh, Alia asks, what is the biggest misconception about hackers? The biggest misconception is that hacks are really complicated, right? Uh, in the industry, in information security, we say there's the advanced persistent threat. Like, it was a possibly a nation state. It was Russia or China, the entire country that hacked us, and it was really impressive. Twitter was hacked primarily, allegedly, by a 17-year-old who was on some channel and asked nicely, hey, anybody want to give me admin rights? I'll, I'll pay you some money. Okay, oh, oh no, I have admin rights to all of Twitter. What do I do? Let's do a Bitcoin scan, right? So that's my probably biggest misconception is that hacking is always complicated. Um, list, uh, link to the list of files that Microsoft says are unsafe. Yes, uh, that's going to be in the slides that are going to be posted at the end of this. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. What if TikTok made that rumor so people would download the app? Inception there, nicely done. Trust nobody, I wouldn't say trust nobody, but be careful about who you trust. Da, 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 da. What is Jeff's Instagram? I don't really Instagram, mostly I follow my wife who shares pictures of my dogs, or my dog, he's a really cute Australian Shepherd. All right, so whether it's uh, Android Meterpreter or Windows Meterpreter, uh, that's the, the hack that Metasploit uses to stay inside your environment. It's the payload, to use the right terminology, but jargon is hard. All right, so let's say I have internal access now. I want privileges, and maybe privileges take the form of somebody posted a username and password for an internal uh, Twitter application on their Slack, all right? Well, it turns out Metasploit has automated a lot of, after you've gained access, um, here's how to gather a bunch of stuff. They call this pillaging, right? They're like, if I make it into your house and just start stealing your stuff, that would be pillaging, right? And there's a Metasploit module, post multi-gather Firefox credentials, because maybe, maybe you used Chrome or Firefox or Internet Explorer to save your credentials to a site, right? Maybe, well, Metasploit's been through this before. They know how to recover those plain text credentials, right? So they'll have the actual username and password that I could just reuse to some internal application. In other words, this is kind of the easy button sometimes, all right? Um, in terms of HTTP, in terms of websites, there's this thing called the cookie, right? The cookie, it's named that way for silly reasons, it's how you remind the web server of who you are, right? And that cookie is just a plain little piece of text. And if you steal that cookie, if I steal it from Isaac's machine, or I don't know, Lee Whitfield's machine, and say, hey, Twitter, this is me, Twitter says, okay, what do you want to tweet today? Lee, and I say, I want to uh, post lots and lots of memes to Lee Whit Whitfield's account. And there are lots of these post-exploitation models, this gathering stuff from compromised machines, from boxes you've gained control of, boxes you've hacked, whether it's a Windows box or an Android or Mac OS or even Linux, right? And I had the, the command there from this morning. There are 346 different built-in easy buttons for if you've compromised a box, here's how to steal this type of stuff. Now, the morals come into play here, of course, but the power is a big important piece, right? So I, I wanna walk through not just how to answer this one question of how does the Metasploit work, but I'd instead like to say that life is full of really interesting questions. And how do you answer those questions? You build some kind of lab, 
right? Heather talked about her separate machine, her separate uh, iPhone that she would use for lab stuff, because you're testing stuff all the time. I know Sarah Edwards in the digital forensics uh, section of, of SANS does the same thing, right? Life is full of interesting questions. And if you make it easy to answer those questions, well, then you can find them out. And listening to somebody drone on to you for hours on end, <coughs> bad classes, cough, um, you don't tend to remember that stuff as well. But the stuff that you learned, uh, because you tested it yourself, because it was interesting to you, you tend to remember that really well. So why build a lab? Because of all the things I just said, right? If you don't believe that antivirus is a broken industry, play with it. Set up a, a Windows virtual machine so you don't have to endanger your own box and try some of this stuff directly out of Metasploit. If you Google, right, and, and, and I'm trying to make this easy, right? If you make a, uh, come on. If I Google Metasploit create exe payload, it even auto completed for me, right? There's a walkthrough, multiple walkthroughs on how to make your own start uh, from scratch uh, executable, like I was talking before about the um, uh, chrome.exe, chrome setup or whatever, right? I have lots of questions. Oh, what is Metasploit? Metasploit is a, a whole bunch of software available essentially for uh, that, that good hackers use, like myself when I'm testing my, my clients, because people pay me to hack them, which is awesome. Um, but we have quite a few questions as we go here. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, Zoom having security issues. Yeah, the, the, the thing is that every platform has issues. If you put two lines of code together, you're going to have at least three issues found over time. There have been actual security problems, but I'm more worried about people's response to those security problems. And Zoom is frankly doing pretty darn well. Um, where do you find these easy buttons? Yeah, things like Metasploit and trying it out yourself in your home lab. Because after you've um, discovered this stuff in your home lab, after you've walked through somebody's tutorial online, then it's easy to do in practice as well. Um, if you use a VM and a virus gets on your VM, does it affect your normal computer as well? Not directly, not really. Um, there are some attacks where you can get from a VM to whoever is hosting that VM, but they're pretty darn rare. Keep your VMware, keep your virtual box up to date. You don't have to worry too much about that. If you really want and you're testing something bad, right, some hacker wares online, then there's things called snapshots. Revert to snapshot, like a, an entire copy of your VM from a point in time is pretty darn powerful. Uh, question of how do I use, how often do I use custom software for hacks using versus avail publicly stuff like Metasploit? I use publicly available tools like 99% of the time, maybe with some customizations because, well, uh, antivirus is a doomed industry uh, that tries to use, hey, if it's Metasploit, it has these three characters, these, th it has MZX in this, in the EXE. Let's mark all the EXEs with MZX as bad, all right? Uh, don't use methods like writing custom shell code to get fully undetectable payloads instead of just using Metasploit modules uh, because a lot of antivirus vendors, which is a doomed industry, uh, will spend a lot of time uh, trying to flag stuff directly out of Metasploit. So usually as I try to confirm that AV is a doomed industry by using Metasploit and getting it past AV and like, oh, you, you got past our AV, how'd you do it? Yeah, well, I took your existing executable which was small, and I added, in fact, it's even in a screenshot. Um, there you go. So this is directly out of Metasploit, a Windows EXE file. Like if you click on it, it runs my bad stuff. Notice that the size is 50 megabytes, slightly over 50 megabytes. That's because I'm taking advantage of a stupid, stupid trick. Stupid hacks work, right? A lot of antiviruses say, if, it's, if the EXE is too big, like 50 megabytes, we don't want to. Just like if you uh, if you have an assignment which was read these 14 chapters tonight, you're probably not going to even want to bother starting. You're probably not going to even skim at that point. AV is also lazy, all right? So that that helps for getting around AV. All right. Uh, why build a lab? Answer interesting questions. There you go. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, how many yeets is Metasploit worth? I had to throw the word yeet in here somewhere, all right? What does my phone record about me? Uh, if you want to have a, a cheap $10 phone, right, 
I got like all of my old phones are still around. It's really easy to use your family members, your friend's old phone and like completely reset it. And now that's a lab phone. It's your test phone. It might be your burner phone as well, but I'm not going to get into uh, burners as well. Uh, do I have a YouTube channel? <clears throat> not so much. Anyway, uh, as for the hardware, look, the stuff that you already have is probably fine for your own lab environment. You see people with uh, pictures online about their whole server room setup, right? Or their own little rack environment. You don't need that you probably are mostly going to be constrained if you have a spinning hard drive as opposed to a solid state disk. That's going to be the main thing that's going to cause you some issues. So <clears throat> uh, apparently, um, I'm not going to say who, but Kate, I didn't, I didn't remove all of the words there, right? What do I mean by a really awesome super duper home lab, right? Look, if there are other people in your house, are they going to object if it's too loud? Probably. So you want like some quiet desktop or quiet laptop to work with. And there's stuff like, hey, parents, I'm trying to learn about a really valued industry so I can get a good job and make lots of money and not steal your money forever, right? And it's going to cost 500 bucks once, and this will be good for three or four or five or six years. That's an easier thing to win over. Or maybe you could work over the summer and 500 bucks takes a while to get, uh, but not too terribly long, right? And that'll last you a long time. And if you want to build your own computer, that's pretty valuable for learning. And you can get pretty strong computers for less than $1,000 these days. And you could also play really, really good games with them. Uh, laptops are getting powerful as well. They can get you a long way. And I have specific links here, like even PC part picker, so it automatically updates for whatever is the best deal as of that time. All right, hypervisor. Look, VirtualBox is free. If your budget is zero dollars, if you have the laptop that you already have, VirtualBox is fine. If you have a little bit of money or you can get it for free because uh, of the school that you work with or something, VMware is pretty common as well to be able to run these virtual machines. All right. Um, question is, what's the most common hack? The most common hack is probably you left your computer unattended and someone started taking actions as you. In terms of just prevalence, right, how often that happens, taking actions as somebody else is probably it. Um, are we going to learn about port forwarding or domain access? Uh, not so much uh, in this particular section. So I want to get you started down the path of answering these questions yourself. And I have some slides on the actual labs to learn this yourself. But I have to get there first. And there's lots of fun questions. Any computer languages you could recommend? Python, Python, Python. If only there was some kind of talk today coming up from a certain Mark Baggett about Python. Python is amazing, right? Uh, I remember seeing a present uh, a, a blog post online about how many lines of code, how complicated was it to do some kind of complicated chess problem. And everybody was giving like, oh, it's 200 lines. It's 500 lines of code. And the Python answer is like, it's two lines. Because somebody already built this problem out. So it's like, import that person's solution, and then do the thing. Two lines in Python. Python is amazing. Python is a great place to start. Um, how did I make my EXE bigger without breaking it? I literally just appended random bits from my computer. Uh, at the end. It's not how EXEs are supposed to work, but it turns out they work just fine that way. Um, can that laptop run Siege? I honestly don't know what Siege is, but yes, my laptop could run it. It's pretty powerful. Um, yeah, da, 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 da. Does SANS teach advanced hackers or beginners or both? They definitely teach both. Does VirtualBox work on Ubuntu? Yes, I'm running it on Ubuntu now, or VMware as well. Um, favorite hack and how to do it? I can't answer that given the time frame remaining. Python is epic. Yes, it is. What is Cisco switching? Cisco is a big company that has existed for a long time that, like if you plug your machine into Ethernet, right, a switch, they're the ones that connect it all together and across the internet as well. Is C++ still relevant? Yes, but I'm running out of time. So I'll answer more of these questions as we go, right? You don't need money for Microsoft licensing, period. Uh, I have the exact link in this slide and I'll share it, but when Microsoft gives you for free 90 day trials of Windows, whatever you want, right? You can even download it for VirtualBox or VMware or like Hyper-V on Windows. You have lots of options 
to work with. If you want Windows Server Edition, the fancy server edition, they'll give you 180 day trials and they'll just send you a few emails during. Not a huge deal. You already get enough spam. And frankly, on average, you probably ignore your email anyway, so ignore that email too. Um, once you start getting into college, Microsoft has Azure Dev Tools for Teaching because they've renamed it like three times um, and that gives you free real copies. All right, if you want Linux, out of the box, there's a whole lot of turnkey Linux stuff. What is turnkey Linux? You're like, I want to learn about Drupal. It's a content management system like WordPress, a blogging platform. Uh, download, receive Drupal, an old version with vulnerabilities, with a whole lot of plugins. Really valuable to start off with. So start off with. Um, anybody touched a new Windows box or just reinstalled? And like for the next month or so, every time you touch that machine, you're like, ah. I forgot to install the thing. I don't have my games yet. Now, Steam is most of what you need, right? But there's a lot more than just Steam, right? So, ninenights.com is pretty awesome because you can just check the box for uh, Chrome. Uh, in terms of most popular web browsers, did you all know that Internet Explorer is the world's most popular web browser for installing Chrome? Yeah, it's the first and most popular web browser used to install Chrome is Internet Explorer. It's amazing. All right, uh, lots of stuff you can download because like uh, Putty for getting into Linux boxes or Notepad++ because the built-in Notepad for Windows is horrible, right? If you want Python, you want to get started, there's the Python checkbox at N-I-N-I-T-E dot com. You download it, you run it, and it downloads all of those things for you automatically, silently. It's pretty awesome. All right, stuff on the internet. If you want your own like domain on the internet. I guess I am talking about domains. There are some domains that are actually available for free. You're not going to set up your own email for it in practice or it's not going to be allowed. Uh, because it's free, it turns out a lot of spammers use .tk, for example. But there's some stuff that you really need your own domain for testing. So I got for free jrmlabs.tk. And I argue that um, uh, Freenom, the company that gave me this, is bad the concept of upselling because they tried to give me other free domains as well. Hey, you're buying something for free. We're going to make it up in volume by giving you more free things. That's not how commerce works, but okay, I'll take them for free. All right. If you want your own server on the internet, I have some resources here. Look, five bucks a month for your own server on the internet. You can run uh, your own Minecraft server for literally five bucks a month from it and do a whole bunch of other stuff because it gets you your own place on the real internet that anybody can go to. Now, this has its own dangers as well, but frankly, learning about the problems that you'll face is a really good learning opportunity as well. You can even have your own domain, like jrmlabs.tk, or I don't know, randalljones.ml, and point it at the IP that DigitalOcean gives you for five bucks a month. Now you have randalljones.ml on the public internet that anybody can go to and type it into join your Minecraft server or whatever, right? Don't build your own DNS server. Just don't, just don't. Don't even think about it. Nope the heck out of that situation, right? Yeah, don't do it, right? So don't administer your own DNS server, right? All of this really, really complicated server administration, that's not why we have lab environments. We do it because it's fun and it answers interesting questions, right? So keep things simple. Labs that people build up, like those really uh, powerful servers that I said it before, showed before on screen, people tend to make those and then not mess with them because it was so hard to set it up to begin with, right? So one or two or even three different virtual machines together can answer a lot of stuff, right? So um, I'm even gonna make it a little bit more simple. If you have just like your one Kali VM, the one that uh, Sans gave you for this webcast, use that and then browse to modern.ie. And again, I have the, la the exact link, but Microsoft gives you doo -doo -doo, developer resources. Click at the bottom, virtual machines, download VMs, right? Oh, look, I would like a Windows 10 VM for free, please. Click, okay, I, I guess in four minutes from now, I will have it. It's that easy to have your Windows VM for your lab environment. Boy, is that easy to work with. Now I'm gonna cancel that download because I don't wanna download it again, but my goodness, is that easy to work with. So if you wanna get into forensics, if you pause that VM, you have like a memory forensics place to work with. You can see the attack, 
lots of valuable stuff to work with, right? And there's more uh, details in the notes. If you want to learn more about individual like hacking challenges, volnhub.com. Uh, is free downloadable virtual machines that once you have VMware or VirtualBox, you can just import them. And usually they're like boot to root, cool way of saying you boot the VM and then you find your way to get con full control of it. And a lot of them have great walkthroughs, even full walkthrough videos. So if you get stuck, you try it for yourself. But if you get stuck for more than like a minute or two, watch the next part of the video because there are so many of these VMs that the issue is not you run out of VMs. The issue is you getting bored and moving on with your life, right? So instead, keep the interest going by watching the video or reading the next part of the walkthrough, right? Syracuse University has some great attack and defense labs walking through, freely available, uh, have great walkthroughs, of uh, all of how this works for like binary exploitation, right? Real hacking, as some people would label it, right? The people who make shirts like this, by the way, Sand Security 760 coin is on here. And that's like the attacking the Windows kernel itself and taking advantage of missing flaws. Really, really powerful. All right. Counterhack makes great uh, hacks, uh, challenges available for free every year. So you can look through those prior ones. And there are great walkthroughs for those. You don't even have to have a VM. There's great walkthroughs start to finish using stuff on the public internet as well. So shout out for, honestly, Chris LG is talking up next and he'll be talking, uh, and he's a member of Counterhack Challenges where I used to work as well. And they build these free challenges that are, have great walkthroughs uh, available on the public internet, All right? Here's the TLDR slide, because of course I have to have it. And whew, I have four minutes left for questions. Um, am I familiar with the Cyber Mentor? I've heard, heard good things, but I, I haven't uh, do too much. How would I hack like a keyboard on a mouse? Well, there's fake keyboards and mouses you can plug in and have it automatically type stuff. That's uh, fairly common. If you want to look up USB rubber ducky, that's a great place to start off with. Best coding application, Visual Studio Code or Sublime Text are just fine. Uh, Rainbow Six Siege is apparently the name of that program. That's fine. Python's a great place to start learning to program. Yes, absolutely. Uh, hacking involves Python and other programming commonly, but not necessarily. Um, Steam is also epic. Yes, absolutely. Internet Explorer is trash. Get off those. Yeah. Chrome is a RAM eating nightmare. Yeah. But there, it turns out Internet Explorer, the new version, is just built on Chrome anyway. They're like, yeah, that's a, that's a great browser. This is ours now. All right. Um, simplest hack on how to do it for pen testing? That's a great question. And the, some of the slides I skipped over are taking advantage of a specific flaw um, in a program called IceCast. And in fact, I'll, since you have the recording of this, I'll scroll back to that slide for a moment. IceCast 2.0.1 is a really, really easy uh, piece of vulnerable software. It's like free streaming, share your music with your friends. But if you run that version, anybody can take control of your machine. So do that in a VM that you download for free. Uh, but there's even a shout out for the exact Metasploit module to take over a machine. So that's a great place to start. And it sure starts to feel pretty awesome. All right. Uh, I really like this class. That Thank you very much. How to hack Kali. Kali is usually used for attack, but it is a Linux machine. You can attack it as well. Uh, is the Windows VM an ISO disk file? No, it's just, it's easy to import. It's a file open point VMware added, that type of file. You don't have to walk through the install. What advice do I give people to keep them secure online? Install Chrome, install LastPass, track your logins for a month, and then go back and change all of those passwords because credential stuffing is huge. Let me say that again. Install Chrome, install LastPass, the browser extension, let it add your sites to LastPass as you log into places over the course of the next month or so, and then change your passwords for all of those sites that all the ones LastPass has recorded. At what age did I start hacking? Um, I started authorized hacking in college. Is Firefox a good browser? Firefox is absolutely great. Info about DEF CON badges. My DEF CON badge is slightly off screen. Ah, but here's my DEF CON safe mode badge. Uh, they have fun things to hack, but they're kind of their own specialized thing. I have two minutes left. Um, what is it, the laptop's name again? My laptop name is Blue because of Pokemon Blue, because Pokemon existed before Pokemon Go. Uh, what programming languages are required other than Python? A lot of people would recommend to learn some kind of systems language like C or C++. I have one minute left. Does Tor 
uh, network really protect your privacy? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does a pretty good job. Um, there's been some attacks against it, but I'm not worried about it. Do I like the new Microsoft Edge all in caps? Yes. Uh, what Python software do I suggest for beginners? Uh, learn uh, Python the hard way is pretty darn good. If you want to get into uh, the more hacking style, then uh, Black Hat Python is pretty darn good. But Mark Baggett will answer that in more detail. Uh, how do I get a cyber law mentor? Uh, maybe Ben Wright from SANS can point you in the right direction. Um, is the terminal used for hacking? Often, yes, so. And can I gain access to a machine disconnect from the internet? Not really. I apparently have a couple seconds left. What is the relation to kick ass in the beginning? Because the original talk title, uh, they're totally going to censor this live. The original talk title was building your own kick ass home lab. I didn't say that live. And that's why I have the logo on the side. All right. Is Safari a safe browser? Yeah, it's fine. I like to make fun of it. Um, Jeff Nellon, a VM from a site. It'll be in the, in the slide notes. And I'm now out of time. And, and that is Jeff McJunkin, everyone. Hi, everybody. The, the, the fastest talking uh, infosec guy on the planet. <laughs>